city, so that has to be dealt with. It's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not good. Incredible. Well, welcome to Florida. I'm happy to host you here. I feel like I'm kind of like welcoming you to our state unofficially, but- Thank you for being such a, a welcome host. <laughs> Happy to. I internally am like a drink? Stewart, Julia Cha. Absolutely. What would you like? I'll mix it up right now. Uh, I'll take. I'll take. Well, I'll take a medical marijuana permit. <laughs> like I wanna, I've never Let had. Me call one. John Morgan. You'll get the reference, Nick. We'll call John Morgan. We can get the medical marijuana, and it will happen. It's just that's Florida. That's our state. We're a ridiculous place to live right now. Excellent. So welcome. We are officially streaming live. Uh, hello to everyone out there connecting. I know I have viewers from all over the world here today. Sotheby's colleagues, friends, artists, all of our Orlando people. I could not be more excited. And you'll have to forgive me ahead of time. I'm probably having that fangirl crush. It's kind of like I just reached into a room with NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. Forgive the reference, that's not aging me. I'm here with Nick Natton and James Altucher, two huge and again, words. Words are going to be a thing with me today. That's okay. Forgive me on that. I could do their bios. You wouldn't like that because it would take up the 20 minute show for each. So go ahead and Google if you have not already researched Nick or James, go ahead and do that for yourself. But I'm going to introduce our Colonel of Mississippi and he will actually appreciate that because I did my research. Our Colonel yes. of Mississippi, James Altucher, at from the age of 12, uh, you are absolutely a colonel correct yes and i should be addressed as such <laughs> at all times thank you for now also, going forward. by the way i was i couldn't get it at age 12 but i got it a few years ago i'm also an honorary colonel in kentucky which is you got kentucky? <laughs> yes elvis presley muhammad ali colonel, colonel sanders, sanders and me congratulations well deserved oh my gosh i'm like worked again, hard for it really. So everyone, you need to research James and Nick on every level. If you haven't watched all of Nick's documentaries, now's a good time to start. And I highly recommend starting with Choose Yourself. So Nick Nanton, 15 time Emmy, like you, you've gotten all of the Emmys, you're a TV producer, documentary, like everything that you do again, Sometimes I fail with words, but it's okay. What I really want to introduce you as is a pirate from Barbados. Is it okay to say that to me? Hey, that's why I became a lawyer. I can still pillage. Were, were, were you a pirate hunter at any point? Uh, I have you not ever been in the hunting of pirates as of yet. There's still All time. that time at Levin Law School at UF as a gator. And uh, we're going to introduce you forevermore as a pirate. That's what you get today. So forgive me for being anti-formal, but that's my stake in the game and my claim to fame. I just want to be really personal with both of you today. And James, it is a true honor to have you here today. I feel well, like the moment, oh, you're welcome. So I, I really want to say to everyone watching, you know that I've been doing actionable steps with social media influencers and industry leaders to find actionable ways to embrace your life right now and make steps towards a better and brighter tomorrow. And there's no one better to talk to than James Altucher. And if you haven't read his book, Choose Yourself or watched the documentary series that just started this last week, please do take the time to invest in that because it will change your life. James, I want to just pass it over. I want you guys to actually introduce yourselves a little bit better, things that you're most proud of because you know yourself better than anyone. Sure. Uh, I am, I've had a, a wide variety of, of careers and I guess that's what I'm most proud of. So I've been sort of, I was a software developer, but then I worked at HBO and I did uh, a web series that I shot as a TV pilot. So I got some, you know, interest and exposure in, in that world. Then I started a company, sold it, uh, then went, I didn't, I realized I didn't know anything at all about what I was doing. I knew, had no, I got lucky and won the lottery and I just, it took me about a year and a half. I lost all my money, tens of millions of dollars went down to, I remember there was one day I went to the ATM machine and I was, I had like PTSD about checking my bank balance and I had $143 left and two kids to support. And I had bought this huge apartment. So I had all these expenses and I was just so depressed. And I, I, I wanted to come back from it, but I was just too depressed. And, and over time, I kind of figured out some tools to, to bounce back, but then made money again, lost money again. I became an investor. I started writing about investors, started writing books, 
lost all my money again, built a website, sold that, lost it again, uh, sold a mental rehab facility, lost the money again, uh, on and on until finally I was just like, screw it. And I just focused on writing, which was my original love and podcasting and just being honest about all these times that I lost everything. And that turned out to have a, uh, a very, you know, an, an audience that was large that related to what I was going through. And I was in real time describing losing money and then bouncing back. And oddly, that gave me a lot of business opportunities that I was able to do well with. And I finally learned a little something about money and, and, and more securely bouncing back in particular, how to, how to train my idea muscle or creativity muscle or what I sometimes call the possibility muscle. And that, that turned out to be extremely useful up until this very day, a few minutes ago, working on, on some possibilities. And uh, uh, you know, I've, I wrote a book, Choose Yourself, which sold uh, well over a million copies about kind of how I went through this and bounced back. And more recently, I wrote a book, which is not coming out till next March, called Skip the Line, which is how to basically switch careers, no matter what your age, no matter what your background, and quickly move to the point where you can make money at whatever you're interested in. So about five years ago, I started doing stand-up comedy, and everybody told me, you can't do this. You can, what do you think you're doing? You can't do this at this age. And right before the lockdown, I had come back from touring the Netherlands. I've performed all over the country. And so, you know, I've been a stand-up comedy uh, comedian as well. So I love that you're a huge advocate for seizing the moments and opportunities, the passions inside of your soul at any age, whether you are 40, 50, or et cetera, that there's opportunity within every day. And I know that you hate the sense of purpose because it projects this idea that you have to fight into that identity when really there are so many moments and opportunities right here before ourselves that we can be embracing. And Absolutely. you are- you're, you're, you're a pinnacle of that. You've done that in every aspect of your life. And originally when I set up this interview, the number one question in my, in my brain was, how did Nick and James become acquainted and ha start these conversations? And when you get in depth into what Nick does with his storytelling and the fact that you connect with people most authentically at the deepest level, you know, whether it's business or personally by sharing your raw authentic truth in the downturns and those moments that maybe we're embarrassed that we don't want to share. You did that. You did that fully. 2008, 2009, you just put yourself out there. You're like, this is who I am. And I think we originally connected at that point at LinkedIn. And my memory's a little fuzzy. I have a little bit of a hard time thinking back that far uh, to my high school days. But um, no, just kidding. Um, but really, you Nick know- Nick and Jeffrey when, Epstein hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. When you're out there talking about your story, that's when I most resonated and wanted to say, hey, James. And I think you answered an email five years later. It happens. It's kind of a thing. But you know, when Nick talks about telling stories and how people connect to one another on these intimate levels personally, I, I'm so curious at what point did this relationship start as far as the Choose Yourself documentary? And Nick, how did you come become acquainted with James? Yeah, so I was introduced to James by a mutual friend of ours, Addison Wigan, who actually uh, helped put together the film because he, I didn't know James, I knew who he was. Uh, and he said, you know, there's a story to be had here. So James and I met for coffee and, and uh, as you'll find out from, it was such an easy project to work on. It was so hard to figure out how to cover every aspect of James, but it was so easy because he's so open. And so what you'll know, I, I know this about James, he knows this about me. What you see and what you get here is the same type of conversation we have everywhere we go behind doors on planes and cars and cabs in London, wherever we filmed. And so it was just great to, number one, it was great to just um, have great conversations. So like I've been working, you know, myself for the last 10 years. And one of the big things that I really advocate is uh, my mentor, Dan Sullivan, talks about just only operating within your unique ability, which is what you're, you're really meant to do. And then having other people around you who are really great at the other things. And my unique ability is having impactful conversations that lead to produced outcomes. And so 
all I did with James was have great conversation. And it's so easy. It was so much fun. And it was so open. The hard part was figuring out how do we take this guy who's essentially, you know, did everything he thought he was supposed to do and it all went wrong. And it wasn't until he started swimming upstream and doing basically what if there was another way? And what if you didn't know about that way? Cause you were never taught that way in school. And, and I just started going down sort of those rabbit holes. But I also found that for me being, having grown up, you know, in the Orlando area, but been in the music industry and then getting into film and TV and books, choose yourself as a book that, um, in under a different title and not nearly as well written that I, I would have written too. It's sort of like, you know, I've been telling my artists and my acts and my clients for years, don't wait for that, you know, 65 year old man behind the desk to tell you you're good enough. If that's what you're waiting for, you're going to be severely disappointed when it happens. Um, quick example, and I'll shut up, but I, I represented bands for years as an attorney. I had a band that was signed million dollar record deal, but let's just do the math. Five guys in the band. So million dollars, a lot of money. It was like in the 90s. All right, but there's five of them. So even at the most, it'd be 200 a piece, which is not rich. By the way, it took three years to make the record and they had to spend most of the money on the record. So basically these five guys are living on like 25 grand a year each for three years on a million dollar record deal. The day the record is ready to go out from the label to promotion, to the industry's down, so budgets are tight. The record shows up on the table of the record label president the same exact day as one other record and he's got to decide. One was their record one was barney the purple dinosaur i will let you decide which one you think went out so these people spent their entire lives trying to impress this one guy they impressed the one guy the guy spent a million dollars on him and they still ended up wasting three years of their life and the record was never heard and they lost all their momentum broke up as a band just you know hated music basically they didn't hate it but you know they're just just frustrated with it and so choose yourself is that exact same mentality uh and that's what i've been trying to help my clients and friends do for years because there's been so many times i couldn't get a seat at the table even though I thought I had something to provide or add to the conversation, I couldn't get a seat at the table. So Choose Yourself is a, a book I quote often, and uh, it's, it's a philosophy I, I highly believe in. Oh, I love the way Thanks, you just encapsulated that entire story. You know, that was I mean, better than I could encapsulate it. <laughs> That's James, why Nick's the documentarian. No. I wanted to do this one-on-one -on -one with James today because I love giving my undivided attention to an individual and my purpose in life. I know you hate that word. It's okay. Deal with it. Mission, call it mission. My mission in life is to authentically listen to people, hear their story, their why, what their goals and aspirations are and connect them to the people and resources that I have in my periphery to make those goals reality. And I think actually Nick and I had a moment earlier today where that may have happened. You know, when you take the time to really find out who someone is and what they're doing and James, that's what I adore about you. You have this fascination and this hunger to really just kind of dive in deep to who someone is, what they're doing, where they're going, how they got where they are. I mean, you've interviewed some incredible people. Coolio, let's just say, we'll leave it at that. When you, cool. Coolio I mean, is always the example I give because <laughs> I guess that was just like, at that time, the biggest ask for me. And I had already interviewed, I don't know, Tony Robbins, Wayne Dyer, Tim Ferriss, Arianna Huffington. But Coolio was just like from childhood on, like was like my favorite musician. And uh, uh, to actually be talking to that. him was amazing. <laughs> we all love Gangster's Paradise. And there's so much authenticity and just the raw passion of what he put together with the music. But you really, what I love about you too, James, is that you seem to have this mindset and this ideology. I picture you being, and forgive me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. I picture you being this person whose brain is 10, 20 years in the future. Like you are just seeing things and doing things in your 10 point list that are so far ahead of the scale of where we are today that allow you to adapt and pivot kind of in a quicker pace than maybe most people are prepared for. And right now specifically, I'd love to know what you're doing and where you're at, because I'm sure your mind is in like 2030, but you're like here in this physical present. So tell me a little bit about what you have going on presently, because sure. I have a feeling that there's a lot to come. Sure. Well, well, you know, right now is such an interesting time because again, it's not like pe people ask, like we, we discussed earlier, is the economy up or is it down? And that's like this linear way of looking at the economy. It's on a scale of one to 10. Is it a 10 or is it a zero or which direction? Is it? But the economy is more three-dimensional in that. And what's happened now is that it's just upside down. We don't know. Like 
the basic way of measuring things is gone. And that means not only for society, but even as an individual, like let's say you just got furloughed. You're one of the one out of three American workers who got furloughed and then your job comes back. Is it going to stay back? Is it going to go away again in a month? We just don't know. And this uncertainty is, is very upsetting to everybody. And, and, and we can't blame anybody. You, you can't agonize over it. You just have to say, well, what am I going to do now? And, and you, you, you observe all the insanity that's happening around. And there's so much insanity. You can really say, we're just, we might just be play actors in some VR game in some <laughs> other dimension. Who knows? I mean, last night, uh, the largest Twitter hack in history, uh, just randomly like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Joe Biden, Huge. of course me, hacked. <laughs> Uh, what were you uh, saying last night with that glass of wine at three in the morning? Everyone got, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, and so, but just like every day, there, there's something insane happening. And mm -hmm. and I've never, nobody's ever seen this before. And so I don't know about 2030. I mean, certainly in 2015, if someone had asked you, Miranda, where are you going to be in five years in the middle, middle of 2020? You would have had the wrong answer. There is no yeah. way you would have had the right answer. So chatting with James Altucher right now would not have come up on the radar. That would have like made me sweat and blush. So in, yeah, in no. the middle of a of a quarantine with a worldwide pandemic and protests, murder hornets, the country. you name it. Yeah. So it's the so, sim so, reality. We were just having this discussion the other night. My friends were like, "Are we in this sim reality? Are we plugged into the matrix? Did we take the red pill or the blue pill?" Everyone's confused because it's so dynamically different than January. And it's a huge shift from five months ago. But, and as, yeah, by Tony the way, Robbins January was insane. Like January, January 1st, what was the news? Nobody even remembers. An entire continent was burning to the ground in the headlines, yeah. Australia wildfires. But nobody, if I were to ask anybody in the street, when, was the, when were the Australian wildfires extinguished? Such an extremely important event. It was the news event of the beginning of the year. Yeah. Again, it was an entire continent blowing up. I bet you zero people could tell me when the fires were extinguished. So zero people remember that the fires happened. It's like our memories were erased. It's a 1984 epidemic of George Orwell's like scientific. Maybe that's who's, you know, scientific. We're, we're literally on George Orwell's shelf. We're a snow globe and he's just shaking us every now and again. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, people are. I would believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I am I am working on stuff and I always like to work on I like to um you know putting it in investment terms I like to invest in myself and and just like any good investment I like to diversify so I I, I invest in experiences you know so that's the reason I started pursuing stand up comedy or or let's say you know other experiences that i've had in my life where i've you know i lived for two or, or three years and just from airbnb to airbnb and that, that was an experiment experience you know experiences have dividends just like investments do but an experience has a dividend every single time you remember it every single time you talk about it every single thing you've learned from it there's there's massive dividends from experiences so it's great to convert money into experiences so being here in in Florida, for instance, is experience for me. I've never, uh, I've never lived here. I've, I, I rented a place for a little while, sight unseen, and so this is an experience. But, but also, I, I do think now is an opportunity. I have not been excited about actual entrepreneurship for about 14 years until right now. In this environment, there's so there's there's literally a trillion dollars in the economy that has no home. It wasn't mm -hmm. given to anybody. It's in bank, you know, the, the stimulus came down and very little of it was given directly to people. The rest of it sort of disappeared. And there's various economic reasons for that, which we don't have to get into, but it will be picked up by the smart players now. And uh, so I've been kind of thinking of, and, and you know, one thing is the whole nature of ideas is that most ideas are bad. So when I write down 10 ideas a day just to keep the idea muscle exercised, most ideas are very, very bad. So when I describe things that I'm working on, some of these ideas are gonna seem, boy, that idea is so bad. I can't believe this guy who's supposed to be mildly intelligent is thinking of that idea. But some ideas are bad and some ideas are good. You don't know until 
you actually start experimenting and trying not and by experiment don't throw all your money into an idea figure out ways to experiment without money or or time you know experiment by having an experience first and see if the dividends lead to more experiments and so uh you know one idea one idea i'm working on is well we're we're talking on zoom right now this is kind of like a podcast that we're doing on zoom zoom has a lot of zoom didn't expect at the beginning when they started they didn't expect that there would be events with opera singers singing on them and hundreds of people in the audience you know this was not one of the things that, that zoom was thinking zoom didn't really expect that they would be used that much for podcasts everybody was doing podcasts in person by this point and now we're all doing millions of people are doing podcasts remotely so what's zoom missing zoom you're recording on your side but what if I disconnect or what if my connection is no good? You're going to get bad audio quality. The video quality is okay, but it's not great. Uh, the chat's not so good if, for big events. And I'm listing just a few things. There are many problems with Zoom. So part of my idea list for a couple of days in a row or what are all the things I would like to see in Zoom as a podcaster? And so now I am, I have a software background. I am making a kind of new Zoom with all of the features that I want. And at the very least, I'll use my product. And then if it's good, and if I think it's good, and I've been a podcaster for six or seven years, maybe other people will think it's good. So that's one thing. Another thing I'm working on, a lot of, um, you know, everybody is moving, you know, obviously, we're all on the internet, but people now are moving towards the internet for education, for online learning for a lot, their e commerce has shot up considerably. So uh, I am buying or, or working on a business model to buy uh, lots of small apps that are very popular and make you know a certain amount of money. And you could, uh, in many cases, you could buy them for super cheap prices. But if you aggregate them, there's backend synergies that you can get. And you know, and I think if you do it in the online education space in particular, there's there's a lot of opportunities to create a new type of sort of mobile or remote you know schools. You know, California they just announced. They're not going to open up their LA and, and San Francisco schools. Kids need to get educated. So there's some opportunities there. Uh, I'm, I'm also working on. Um, so this is this is the, the 58th day in a row that I'm wearing pajamas. So no. I, have, I have not worn anything but pajamas for the past 58 days, day and night. And I've been on four plane rides. I've been in restaurants. I've been outdoors. I've been over the neighbor's house. I've been, I went to the Black Lives Matter protests, all in pajamas. And <laughs> my theory is, why not? Like the whole world's different now. Nobody, I don't have to wear a suit or formal clothes or those are all stiff. I don't need pockets for anything. What do I need pockets for? And by definition, pajamas are the most comfortable clothes. You could sleep in them. They're so comfortable. So why not all the time wear pajamas? So the purpose of this experiment is if people, nobody has criticized me for it and people have complimented me sometimes like, well, where'd you get that? What are you wearing? So I'm thinking of pajamas, but with outerwear designs and, and um, copper infused because people don't realize this copper has antiviral properties. So for mm -hmm. instance, the top trending Kickstarter right now is something called hygiene hand, which is a, a brass doorknob. Brass doorknobs are made out of uh, half tin, half copper. And the reason is historically, you could the research goes back thousands of years. Copper is a disinfectant and has antiviral properties. So who knows? Maybe it's even good for a virus like this. So if I you make copper, a little silver in that and we're set a little uh, silver and we'll. Yeah. I, I researched that. Silver is. Well, that's why silverware is silver because mm -hmm. it's a it's a natural anti that's that's a disinfectant. That's why cavities are silver. But silver works in moist conditions, copper in dry conditions. So, I'm going to make you a commitment. I've never yeah. run a marathon before in my life. I'm dedicated to do that in Napa Valley with my friend Michael Finelli, who's trained uh, like Olympian marathon runners. I'm just gonna, it's not gonna be great. It's gonna be like a 20 minute mile. So two days later, you're gonna see me finish that marathon. I will run it in me. your active wear. 
uh, as a testimony to everything you're stating here, because I think what I love about you, you have this ingenuity and you're constantly looking for the moment and the opportunity and the puzzle pieces to connect the people and the resources that you have. It's, it's a very unique skill set. You have a much bigger story than Nick. You did a great job sharing the story, but right. it's so much broader than that. You can't capture the essence of James Altucher on uh, eight you did a good job. It, Nick did a better job than I could have done. So I have to give him <laughs> credit. For hey, I'll get James. I got one word for you. Suit jamas. Have you ever, have you ever bought some suit jamas? Well, I have Sephara. Like, can we make them Sephara with like, I want like 1200 thread count, Egyptian. Whatever you Sephara. like. Yeah. As a, a well, present the client gave me. So they're very comfortable. It's interesting. I did have a pair of copper infused pajamas that I wore to do a stand-up comedy event. It was an outdoor stand-up comedy event in New York. So we had social distancing and so on. And I posted a picture of it. And a friend of mine said, whoa, I love that orange suit that you're wearing. He, so he thought I was wearing a suit because it had a little bit of a suit-like design to it. Um, but it was too, the, uh, the copper infused made it a little too orange for me. So I'm trying to think of ways to, to, to not make it as, as orange. You know, it's hard to, have, you, it's hard to figure out like how to make a fashion line but this is the whole concept of, you know, choosing yourself and skipping the line. Like no, nobody's really an expert at any of this stuff. Sarah Blakely, you know, who invented Spanx yeah. created a multi-billion dollar company. She was selling fax machines at the time, door to door. I think here in Florida actually, and you know, started a multi-billion dollar fashion line. So again, I think there's, there's, and there's kind of what I call idea sex component to this, taking the antiviral properties of copper, combining it with, pajamas combining it with uh, outerwear and you know which is suits and, and so on and you know maybe there's something interesting so these are these are three of the ideas I'm working on I've also been doing uh, you know more comedy more writing stuff like that and Nick and I have been doing experiments we just took the docu series that Nick made took two episodes released it in we found Nick found a movie theater chain that would release it and if you look at the box off numbers for the weekend, we would be number eight in the country uh, from the box office numbers. I went to the release. Absolutely. It was phenomenal. And you did such a great job, Nick and James, like the way that you encapsulated what James has been through, the ups and downs, the highs and lows, encapsulating those 10 daily idealists. You really did a great job at making it succinct actionable, followable. Like it was, it was very enthralling. And I took my teenagers to it and they didn't hate it, which is a rarity. So thank you and kudos. That's... I think they're passive life lessons. Wait, the teenagers didn't hate it? No, they didn't. Although, can I be frank with you? Of course. My 14 year old daughter who is aspiring to either Harvard or Oxford said very succinctly two times today, mom, you're talking to James? Yes, I'm talking to James. Can you ask him one question? I was like, no. I'm going to ask you, she's a lovely lady. She said, mom, how can he possibly lose that amount of money two times? And how is he not going to lose it a third time? And that was her 14 year old question is, does he not know what a savings account is? She's a 14 year old. Well, she's got a sassy mouse, but that no, was <laughs> it's, it's, it's great questions. I mean, first off, I lost it because I was, because I'm probably on average, a very stupid person. <laughs> And so the, fir the first time around, I, I had cashed out. It wasn't like I sold in stock and then the stock went down. I had cashed out and I bought a huge apartment. I invested in all sorts of stupid private businesses. I bought artwork, which is, of course, has no value you to it. You keep buying artwork. Don't say that. I keep buying artwork. Nick knows I'm an abstract painter. I'll, I'll send you some for free. You can sell it to people. Well, I, and then, and then the second time it was the same thing. Like I bought, you know, I always was trying to make everyone else happy except me. So I would again, uh, buy houses and I, I couldn't say no to my friends who pitched me businesses and all those businesses went out of business. And I don't know. And then another time I got involved in a, in a business that was just, you know, and invested money and it just, it just all went to zero. It's, 
James, uh, I have a question for you about that because I've been thinking about that too. So you've you've said it tw- two or three times around me, you know that you you lucky when you sold your first business for a lot of money, right? So you got you got lucky. Although there's a lot of hard work that goes in that, but you're in your mind, you feel. I mean, and I tell my kids like when they if they're good at an activity or a sport, I'm like, well, first of all, you're lucky because you don't have a disease. You're for, second of all, you're lucky because there's they do that around here. Third, like so many things really are luck. But so did you feel? Like it sounds like you felt guilty to say no because you felt like you somehow you hadn't even really earned the money. It was lucky. Uh, I've heard you just say those things a lot. I just wonder how you connect those. Yeah, and it's it, it's actually interesting you say that. The other day I was rem- just thinking of I remember in two thousand this guy said to me um, out of nowhere he he had made his money as he put it you know through hard sweat blood and tears. And he, he was like a neighbor of mine. He said, I, in, very directly to me, he said, I didn't make it via luck by, like you did. And I was, I was like really insulted, but I just didn't even really understand what he meant. And he, cause I did work hard on my first business, but you know, I had an internet company and there was an internet boom and that helped a little bit too. Um, I didn't realize that participating in a trend could also be a skill. But uh, so I think I did feel very guilty. And I also, I also felt, like I didn't because I didn't earn it. I felt like it was or I felt like in my head, like I didn't earn it so that it was worth zero. So I needed to make more and I wouldn't be happy unless I made more, even though I had enough to live for the rest of my life and, and then some. So I felt this need to kind of keep investing it, keep putting it to work. And I put it in businesses that I wasn't I didn't have a co- cohesive investment strategy, which means you're old. You're ultimately it's like if you're a bad poker player, you might get lucky a few times, but you're ultimately going to lose all your money at the table. And that was me. I made bad investments. I made bad decisions uh, and ultimately lost it all many times. It took me like 20 years to build enough business sense. You know, so 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 that was that handles the first two or three times. I just didn't have the business sense. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what the value of a dollar was and I didn't know how easy it is to to spend. And then. This thir- the third question your daughter asks, which is, am I going to lose it again? Probably, but hopefully not. <laughs> we'll we'll see. I mean, I'm 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 trying very hard to to keep discipline, but I'm always I'm always taking risks and and not quite thinking about it until later. But hopefully now, my my philosophy of risks is that no one risk should threaten you, and and you got to diversify your risks. So no no one risk can 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 threaten you and maybe some risks won't work out and some don't. One thing I do want to address though that she, that your daughter says is a very interesting question. What about a savings account? And particularly for someone young or in their 20s, the worst thing you can do with your money, and I'm saying this now on the other side of all these year decades, is the worst thing you could do with your money is put it in a savings account. Let's say you're 22 years old and you're making 40,000 a year. I'm just making up numbers. If you put, if you save like two thousand dollars, which would be a reasonable amount to save if you're making forty thousand a year, five percent of your earnings, that is useless. You just struggled to save two thousand dollars instead of say buying experiences with those two thousand dollars or buying skills like taking a photography course or something with those two thousand dollars. And by the time you're thirty, that two thousand dollars in your savings account, even compounded, is going to be a meaningless blip to you. You're gonna your earnings potential is gonna be so much greater that that if you have been focused on buying skills and experiences, that you're gonna say to yourself, Oh my god, why did I why did I waste all those hours to save two thousand dollars when I could make two thousand dollars now in a in a you know three days? And uh you know, sa- savings accounts in general are meaningless, particularly now with um interest rates at, at almost zero percent. I'm, I'm going to have a, I'm gonna add a, a quick comment here real quick too, because I know we yeah. got to wrap up. Please, so please. I've had a, a lot of discussions recently with Dan Sullivan, who I've mentioned before, and, and I, he really helped me understand that financial security is a mindset. It's not a number. It's never a number. And yep. unfortunately, people tie it to a number. And what you really should be doing is focusing on uh, how do I continually upgrade my skills, my habits, my abilities, so that you can constantly provide value to the rest of the world. And if you can do that, you will always have financial security because you're constantly making other people's futures bigger and you will never run out of people who are willing to pay you handsomely to do that. But most of us walk around 
our entire lives thinking that there's a number. And if we got to that number and we all know people who've gotten to that number and James, you got, you got to some of those numbers a couple of times and it wasn't the number. It was the mindset. And that's why, that's where it goes. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that. Like friends are always more valuable than money. Whatever you could do with money, I guarantee you, you can do far better with friends. And that means even starting a business, you could start a business. And if you have a lot of money, you can put your money into the business and, and grow a business. But if you have a lot of friends, your friends are going to hook you up with connections so you can get your resources more cheaply. They could teach you things. They could mentor you, but also they could introduce you to people with money. So you don't spend any of your own money to build your business and you could make an even bigger business and make even more money by having lots of friends as opposed to lots of money. Ditto for experiences, experiences more valuable than money. James, Nick, I feel like I could have 10 dozen of these conversations with either of you or both of you simultaneously. I know Nick had a hard stop at 1.30, so thank you for already kind of continuing into this space. I'm happy to talk to James all day if he's got the capacity. I don't want to take away from time with wife and the kids. But on that note, James, there are two people from a social capital perspective. And again, I feel like my main purpose is connecting people and bringing them into unification to kind of be that catalyst and spark towards future change and a better tomorrow. That's my number one goal in one, having these conversations and two, just being a human being in general. There are two people that I wanna introduce you to um, that I think if in one moment, a coffee, a Zoom like this, or a face-to-face -face chat would revolutionize not only your life, their life, but also society. Um, Jamie Joyce is this young, beautiful professional here in who used to be in the Orlando market. She's now in San Francisco. She started what's called the ben, Benjamin Franklin Society Library. And she's currently coordinating with the founder of the internet, not Al Gore, but you know, the actual founder of the internet. And they're talking about data mining and creating kind of a unification for people to source actual data yeah. Oh, one second. Sorry about that. Okay. Nick, have a great day. Thank you Thank so you, much. Nick. Thank you so much. Thanks for everything. Great to see you. Bye. Sorry about that. Um, but I think you and Jamie could have some excellent conversations. She's trying to revolutionize not only the internet, but the way that people communicate and how they get their resources and their facts and their data. I'm going to introduce you to her. And the other one is um, Jason Eichenholz. He is a CTO and co-founder of a company called Luminar, which is a tech-based company um, revolutionizing autonomous vehicles. And it's so funny because that's just a sliver of the scheme and spectrum of thoughts jumping around in his head, also San Francisco here in Orlando. And for whatever reason, those two names have been on my heart all day thinking about you. And I just know that sometimes when you put two people in the same room, amazing things happen. And I just feel inspired by what you bring to the table and what they bring to the table. And something tells me that the world will be a different and better place when you two have a conversation. Or sure, I would love to I would love to talk to them as long as they would like to talk to me. Like there's no pressure Ooh, or I whatever. I wanna talk to you, James. I, I always believe in permission networking. Like you get permission from both sides before you do the intro. So I, I have no problem talking to them. I will happily ask their permission. If they refuse, I might, you know, lay down the lot. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure they'd be happy to converse with you. And I might ask on a similar token, are there any two people that you think the world would be a better place if I got to know better? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's many people I'd have to, I'd have to. If you think. say Mark Cuban, I won't be upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. but that's just it. I could say Mark Cuban, but I don't know if that's someone I, I know how to make the intro. I mean, he's been on my podcast a bunch of times, but I don't know how to make the, the intro. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I, I promise you, I will think about that. The best, the best right combination of, of people. I would love to continue to watch your um, series for Choose Yourself, see how it progresses with Nick's expertise and how you guys develop the entire television series. And also, I think because of the time and space that we're currently living, I would love to chat with you again this fall, kind of after things calm down and just see where you're at and how you're living life and yeah. what advice you have for people economically. A absolutely. Maybe I'll be, um, maybe I have my full line of copper, Active wear. Use clothes uh, uh, out there, and uh, also I'm, um, you know, maybe I'll have a book or book or something, another book out there. Who knows? You'll probably have twelve by then. There's then, no doubt. In, in my August, mind. Where the series is being released on Amazon. Mm -hmm. so August fourteenth, is it? I don't know. 
Okay, Nick I think knows. it's August 14th. I'll post it on here. Anyone who wants to ask James questions, you can probably expect an answer in five years because he deserves that privacy. He gets a million requests a day. Uh, but you're I'll, I'll, I'll go on the comment thread right now and answer some questions. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't watch them live streaming because I like to just give you my undivided attention, but I'm sure people are saying hi right now. And just thank you for your time. I look thank forward you, Miranda. to it. Yeah. Have a great and, day. And thank your daughter for asking such a great question as I well. I will. And I'm sorry if it was rude. She's just got that personality. It wasn't She's rude. Happy. No no questions rude. <laughs> Maybe you'll meet her in person. We'll come say hi there down in South Florida. Excellent. All right. Thanks so day. much, Miranda. Bye. Bye.